Uh, good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here. So uh, I'm going to take you through the major uh, top line highlights of the, the phase three data, which will be presented uh, soon. So uh, on behalf of uh, the co-authors and all the study teams who put an enormous amount of effort into to this, uh, it's my pleasure to present the results of the phase three access trial, which was a trial comparing axitinib and serafinib in a second line setting for metastatic kidney cancer. It's my relevant disclosures. So as Bernard just told you, axitinib is a potent and selective second generation inhibitor of the VEGF receptor family. Um, and as Mace told you, there have been previous trials in a refractory setting. First, now many years ago in the cytokine refractory setting, which showed at the time, uh, I think, the highest response rate reported in an extraordinarily long time to progression. A more recent subsequent trial looked at patients who had failed prior serafinib, and many of those patients had failed other prior therapies, including other targeted therapies. And there was still a very robust response rate and a very long progression-free survival. In addition, in metastatic kidney cancer patients, the standard of care for patients who are resistant to their initial therapy is not well defined. And no randomized trials have compared targeted therapies in this or in any, in any setting. So for this phase three trial, patients were included if they had metastatic RCC with clear cell histology. Measurable disease per assist criteria was required. All patients had resist-defined progressive disease after one and only one prior regimen, which was either sunitinib, bevacizumab interferon, temsorolimus, or cytokine-based. ECOG performance status of 0 or 1, an adequate end organ function was required. Patients who met eligibility were then stratified by ECOG performance status and type of prior treatment, and then were randomized with equal probability to either axitinib at a starting dose of 5 milligrams BID, with an option of upward dose titration to as high as 10 milligrams BID based on tolerance, or to a standard dose and schedule of serafinib, which is 400 milligrams twice daily. As you can see, this was a randomized open-label phase three with the primary objective of comparing the progression-free survival in such treatment refractory patients who had failed what were at the time the, uh, eight, the regimens that had regulatory approval. You can see the secondary endpoints included overall survival, persist-defined response rate, safety and tolerability, duration of response, uh, and as David will report in the presentation after mine, patient reported outcomes. This was indeed a global study across many sites and countries. All patients had tumor assessment largely by CT scan at baseline at week 6 and 12 and then every 8 weeks thereafter. All scans were collected for independent central review, which are the numbers that uh, we'll report. Uh, as far as safety assessments, patients had office visits at week 2 and 4 and then every 4 weeks with home blood pressure monitoring throughout. And quality of life uh, as measured by the questionnaires you see listed there at baseline every 4 weeks of therapy, end of study, and then 28 days after the last dose. As mentioned, PFS was the primary endpoint. Uh, it was defined as time from randomization to either disease progression as assessed by the Independent Review Committee or death. And this trial was designed with 90% power to observe at least a 40% improvement in the median PFS from an estimated five months with serafinib to seven months with axitinib. This is the table of uh, patient characteristics, which is uh, all put on one slide and a little bit small, but it's basically typical of a kidney cancer population. So it's predominantly male predominantly Caucasian, uh, although there are over 20% of patients of Asian descent, relatively equally distributed between ECOG 0 uh, and 1 uh, in balance between the arms. 90% of patients have undergone prior nephrectomy, which is typical of trial, trials in this setting that have not mandated prior nephrectomy. Sites of disease involvement were very typical of a kidney cancer population and lung predominant. And prior systemic therapy in about half the patients was sunitinib, Approximately one-third of patients had received prior cytokines, and a small proportion of patients had received either prior bevacizumab or prior temsorolimus. The last two rows are commonly accepted prognostic schema for classifying kidney cancer patients. The first MSKCC was developed in the cytokine era many years ago. According to these criteria, approximately half the patients were intermediate risk, 40% good risk, and a small proportion of poor risk. The bottom row are risk factors developed by Danny Hang in the targeted therapy era, According to these criteria, approximately two-thirds were intermediate risk, 20% favorable risk, and about 10% poor risk, and again, relatively balanced between the arms. This is the primary endpoint of progression-free survival as assessed by the Independent Review Committee. In these treatment refractory patients, axitinib produced a median progression-free survival of 6.7 months compared to 4.7 months with serafinib. This corresponded to a stratified hazard ratio of 0 0.665 
with a significant p-value at less than 0 0.0001. This table lists progression-free survival both by the Independent Review Committee assessment, which is listed in the first row with numbers identical to the previous slide, and the second row, which is the investigator-assessed uh, progression-free survival. You can see the PFS was slightly longer in terms of median for both axitinib and serafinib as assessed by investigators, although the hazard ratio uh, in benefit of axitinib was nearly identical with a similarly significant p-value. Progression-free survival by type of prior therapy received was also explored. As you can see, patients who had cytokine refractory kidney cancer had a longer median PFS for both the axitinib and serafinib arms, with a hazard ratio favoring axitinib and a significant p-value. In the sunitinib refractory subset, the medians were smaller, although again with a preserved hazard ratio in favor of axitinib and a significant p-value. The subsets of Temsorolimus and Bevacizumab refractory are really too small for meaningful uh, analysis. This is a forest plot that looks at additional subsets based on not only prior therapy, but now performance status, uh, gender, age, et cetera. And what you can see here with the caveats that should normally be applied to subset analyses is that there was a relatively consistent benefit of axitinib across these major subgroups. This slide depicts the secondary endpoint of best objective response by RESIS criteria as assessed by the Independent Review Committee. Axitinib in this setting produced a 19.4% partial response rate compared to 9.4% for serafinib. This corresponded to a risk ratio of 2.1 and a significant advantage to axitinib with a p-value of 0 0.0001. This slide lists drug delivery in both arms. You can see that uh, Proportion of patients in each arm required dose interruptions that were largely due to adverse events. Approximately one-third of patients on axitinib were able to dose escalate, and one-third required a dose reduction. Compared to 52% of patients treated with serafinib who required a do dose decrease at some point during therapy. The median relative dose intensity was well-preserved in both arms, as you can see at over 98 and 91%. The percentage of patients who required drug to be discontinued due to investigator-assessed treatment-related adverse events was 3.9% for axitinib and 8.2% for serafinib. This table lists all causality uh, adverse events uh, of interest, and these generally fell into three categories. There were events such as hypertension and hypothyroidism, which were more prevalent in patients treated with axitinib. There were events such as fatigue and the GI spectrum of side effects, which appeared relatively equivalent between the two arms. And then there were side effects that appeared more prominent in the serafinib-treated patients, including hand-foot syndrome, rash, and alopecia. This is a similar table of all-causality laboratory abnormalities of interest. And you can see from the top four rows that significant <clears throat> cytopenias uh, are, were relatively uncommon in both arms, as well as additional minor lab abnormalities, as you see listed. This is a slide um, borrowed from David's presentation, which looks at uh, time to deterioration, which is a composite endpoint that encompasses uh, both progression of disease as well as progression of uh, disease-related symptoms as assessed by this uh, subscale. Um, and what you can see is that axitinib produced a, a significant prolongation of time to deterioration so accompanying the progression-free survival advantage was a delay uh, in, in disease-related symptoms, uh, as you see listed. <coughs> so in conclusion, axitinib led to a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in progression-free survival compared to serafinib in treatment of refractory kidney cancer. Axitinib had a generally similar, similar safety profile compared to serafinib with the exception of more hypertension and hypothyroidism, but less hand-foot syndrome, less rash, and less alopecia. These data support a hypothesis that more potent biochemical targeting of the VEGF receptor is associated with superior clinical outcome in RCC, and axitinib should now be considered as the reference standard in the second-line treatment of advanced RCC. And just an acknowledgment side again to thank uh, Pfizer and all the study teams around the world who contributed uh, to this phase three study, and of course the patients and families for their participation. Thank you. <coughs>